and welcome mindsetters to this session of Learn Extra Life. Welcome great tens to life science. I'm Ty and I'm here with Cheryl who's going to be taking us through today's lesson. What are we doing today? We're going to be doing a session on ecological biomes today. All right. All right. Okay, so on that note, Cheryl, while you make your way over across the board, I'm going to tell the mindsetters what they need to do. Mindsetters, you know the drill by now. You need to get on the page, get chatting to me, let me know what you guys are thinking. If you're lost in here, if you need help, Post, 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 post. And let me know if you guys are lost anywhere. If you, if you desperately have a question that you need to find out the answer for, just make sure you send it to us. Well, onto the Facebook page. Then I can get that question to Cheryl, and Cheryl can help you out. But as I always say, if you don't post, I can't help you. So make sure you have your pens and pads out, and you're ready to make notes. Because we're gonna about to get on the road with the show. So, Cheryl, take it away. Thank you, Ty. Good evening, grade tens. Today we're going to start off with um, biomes, as you can see from the board. Last week you would have had a lesson on the beginning of ecology, where you looked at all the different biotic and abiotic, the living and the non-living components, all right, that we find in our biosphere. Remember, biosphere that is the part of the earth that uh, has that can sustain life. You're, you did the lithosphere, which was land, the hydrosphere, which was water, and you would have done the atmosphere, which would obviously have been the air. Now, when you looked at certain terms, one of the terms that you looked at was going to be ecosystems, right? And remember, ecosystems was the relationship that the abiotic factors, the non-living, the water, the gases, the air, the temperature, the wind, fire, um, physiographic factors, all of those are going to have an effect on what kind of life, living, a, um, biotic components are going to be living there. So when we look at a biome, all right, a biome is a really, really large ecosystem. Okay, It's a large ecosystem. If I were to give you a term for it, all right, a geographical term, it's a very large ecosystem in what we're going to see that has a common climate. All right, so the situations are the climate, the temperature, all of those are going to be quite similar. And in respect, all right, the animals and the plants, the vegetation, all right, that is all going to be um, quite specific for that particular region. So what we're looking at is a geographical area that has um, very um, characteristic climate conditions, which in turn right, are going to lead to characteristic living organisms that are going to be found there. Okay, so if we have to look, all right, you don't have to know these, right, but I just wanted to put them up on the board to show you that when we look at the world, all right, the world, the, the earth itself has divided also up into, into biomes. If you were doing... Um, Last week, when you were doing abiotic factors, one of the things was latitude, all right? Where the equator, what do we know about the equator? Warmer, lots of rainfall, and as we get closer to the poles, what's going to happen? It's going to get colder, all right? Also, air moves. So even if we look on a large scale, what we're going to see is that the world itself, each, part of, each of our continents, all right, has, a, has its own biome. So we can split it up into really big ecosystems where it's universal across the latitudes over here. Or as we're going to look at today, we're going to look at South Africa specifically when we're going to look at South African biomes. Okay. When we look at the biomes, all right, you should all recognize the map of South Africa. All right, and then when you have a look here, if you have a look on the side, this is just a basic diagram. You will notice quite often that there tends to be a variety of diagrams, all right, and different areas that might just differ slightly when it comes to the biomes, but you mustn't worry. We're just going to concentrate on the major ones, and then we will mention, I won't say the less significant ones, but the ones that aren't as obvious, okay? So when we when we talk about geography, I'm going to mention specifically, all right, the different, um, the different areas, provincial areas. So I'll make use of the Gauteng, the Limpopo province, because I think we're all much more comfortable and are able to picture in our mind, right, which areas they are. And those of you who come from the different areas, think about what your area is like. Have a look, see, you need, you obviously should be aware around you um, of 
When does it rain? When is it hot? When is it cold? What kind of animals do you see? Those kind of things. Okay? So it's also good to have a general knowledge and to have a good knowledge about your country. Some of you who take tourism, right, this will help you as well to have a better knowledge of South Africa. And those of you who love to travel, all right, awesome. You can plan your holidays here. You don't always have to go off somewhere else. Okay, the first one I'm going to concentrate on as you'll see, I've highlighted each area, all right? The first one we're going to concentrate on is the savanna, the savanna biome, okay? If you were to look at it over here, you will see that is the majority of the Limpopo province, okay? Going into slightly here into the Northern Cape. This area over here, some of you might know as the Kalahari, all right? So over here, the savannah moving inwards around there into the Northern Cape. What you'll find here, though we call it savannah, South Africans right, tend to call it bushveld. When you think of South Africa, this is the picture that you generally seem to look at. You know, when you watch the hunting programs and all of that, it's these, all right, these scenes from the bushveld, all right, that you often are going to have a look at. Okay, when we look, as I said to you, remember, okay, the biotic and the abiotic factors are going to have a large effect on each other, more so the abiotic. And what you're going to find here, those of you, all right, who come from the province, we know that we have the winters tend to be somewhat cooler, our summers there are very, very hot. Okay, so we're going to have more rainfall in the summers. It's also a bit of a dry heat because plants tend to, trans um, transpiration seems to um, decrease slightly. So we, sometimes you often hear people talk about in the northern province that it's, it's like a dry heat, not like um, down here where it seems to be far more humid. Okay, so when we look at, I want to just show you the pictures all right, that come to, this is what I want you to think of. When you think of the bush felt, what you're going to think of is the big five. All right, definitely. If I were, go, I'm going to go back to our map, all right, for those of you, what do we find here often? Game parks. Right, Limpopo is very well known for their game parks. Even into Mpumalanga, all right, the area as well, we're going to find the Kruger National Park going from the Mpumalanga upwards into the north, all right, and there you're going to find what we call the big five. Remember the lion, all right, the rhino, the elephant, the buffalo, okay, and the, the leopard, which now I think they're going to make the big six and they want to add the whale to it. Okay, so if we have a look here, all right, if we think of the Limpopo province, elephants are also very, very predominant in that area. And if you have a look, I want to just show you, for vegetation, this is a very common plant, all right, in the tree, in the, in the, um, the Limpopo province. Most of you will know it's the upside down tree or the baobab tree. It's a very, um, it's a common feature in, these pr in, the, in the province. This tree over here, elephants love this tree over here, and some of you, I think, also like the fruit, and that is the marula tree. All right, the marula, elephants also love to eat the, the marulas. I'm sure you've heard of amarula, all right, and they, they love to eat that over there, the elephants. So these are common trees, and if you think about, we make marula juice and everything part of our environment. If we go back, all right, to our map, sorry, if we go back to our map, what you will also notice, okay, is when we talk about the Limpopo province, this side over here does get quite a bit of rain, and that brings with it quite a few problems. Those of you, all right, if the who live there or those of you who might visit there, you need to be careful of malaria, all right? Malaria, quite common in, this, in, this, in the savannah region, okay? We're also going to find the, our South Africa's deadliest snakes, unfortunately, stay here as well, all right? So you've got quite a, quite a, um, a large area filled with a variety, a large variety of our wildlife. And those game parks actually are very important for our country when it comes to tourism, all right, people coming to visit and, and hunting. Okay, let's have a look 
at our next one. We, when we look at the Nama Karoo, we're looking at towards down here towards the Eastern Cape, upwards the Northern Cape, and a little bit of the Western Cape. The Nama Karoo, the Western Coast over here, this is going to be the Succulent Karoo, and up towards just on the edge over here, all right, of the Northern Cape, going into Namibia, are slight desert conditions. South Africa doesn't really have a desert, okay? Starting a little bit over here, but the desert is really much in the, the Namibia area. So when we look at the Nama Karoo, when we look at the Succulent Karoo, what we are going to notice that they, very m they have a very similar climate, okay? They're going, to f they're going to have similar plant life, they're going to have similar vegetation, all right, even along over here. Now, if you will notice, Coming along down here, right past the Western Cape, down through over there, you have got the cold Benguela current. Now that cold Benguela current, right, brings in cool air. And that cool air usually is stable and it sinks. And it does not bring with it rain. What it can bring in is fog, but it doesn't bring in a lot of rain. So what we are going to find here is we're going to find an area where rainfall is going to become a limiting factor. All right? So less rain, you need to then start to realize that the plants and the animals are going to have to adapt right, to that lack of water. When we look at the Namakuru, all right, let me go here. Okay. Oh, there we go. Let me show the pictures. Okay. Some of you might not recognize the things. Okay, but I want to just show you over here. Okay, this is a stone plant. These are plants. Okay, so they're adapted. You'll notice it's not very, um, there's very little water there. These are actually stones, and they actually use um, camouflage. Right, or mimicry, they look like stones so that herbivores all right, do not eat them. You will see quite often all right, in the Nama Karoo and the Succulent Karoo, because of the dryness, when something dies, plants or animals die, they don't decay because there's no water, so there's very little bacteria. So what happens is that plant dying, etc., is going to bring more food for the herbivores. So the lack of decay in these dry areas actually is food for the herbivores. So you'll see here this plant, right, to try and obviously survive, has come up with a different kind of mechanism, right, um, mimicry or camouflage. This acacia tree, all right, is also... You'll notice the trees, there are, there are going to be trees in the, in the Namakuru, but not very much of them. You'll see one of the words we're going to talk about, all right, is endemic. When we talk about an endemic species, we're talking about a species that's found only in this particular place, nowhere else in the world. And this little bird over here, it's a stock, right, it's totally endemic to this area. It's not going to be found anywhere else. The plants that you are going to find, all right, that are going to be there, you're going, it's the same as it's, we're going to find in the succulent karoo, okay? It's dry. So what are we going to find? We need plants that are either going to be able to store water, so your succulents, all right, or they're going to have ways in which their leaves are adapted so that they can lose less water. So they have cactuses which can store, they've got thorns. All right, some of them, like the well witchia plant, can absorb water through its, um, through its leaves, which is very rare. We know that water usually goes through the roots. So all of these plants, or some of them, all right, are in seed, and then when it rains, up they will bloom, and then when the drought comes, they will spend the rest of their, all right, the rest of their term, all right, underground, usually bulbs and tubers. All right, you will also find here there's very little rivers that are perennial. Perennial means all year through. So because you're going to have very little perennials, perennial um, rivers and that, you're going to find, again, there's a lack of water. So what's going to happen when the rain does come? all that sand is usually going to be washed away, 
right? Because there's nothing holding the sand down, so there's going to be a large amount of erosion. So if we have a look, as I said there, if we have a look at the Namakuru, right? Very, all right, very, you'll see here the, the riverine rabbit. And one thing, all right, that the, in the center, in the Namakuru, is well known for its spring box, which, as you can remember, is our national emblem, all right, our buck. Right, but these days, unfortunately, in the Namakuru, there's a lot more farming with sheep and goats. Right? Commercial farming has taken over that area, so a lot of the biodiversity right, is becoming a lot scarcer. Okay, let's go on to the next one. All right. This is the grassland. Now, if you, if you have a look here, the grassland, all right, take lots of the half felt as we call it all right because if we go down here go down to the escarpment down to down to durban right down to the coast so we're looking at areas gauteng right mapumalanga some of kwazulu natal and also some of towards the 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 northern cape there now we'll find the grasslands the grasslands grass all right is a very very hardy species Grass has to be very hardy. The reason being, right, is because they have to survive winters that are very, very cold, all right, and summers that are very, very warm. Although they do have rainfall in the summer, what we usually find here is that our winters can get very, very cold. If you guys can remember, a couple of weeks ago, we even had snow. Okay, and sometimes during the winter we have frost. So if, um, grass has to be able to survive the hottest of hot temperatures and the very, very cold temperatures, and it does that very well. Okay, because remember, grass is, can um, reproduce asexually, vegetative reproduction. You guys all know if you plant a little patch of grass, all right, and then a couple of weeks, the whole area is then covered, even in the garden where you don't want it. But the area is then covered. When we look at the grassland, one of the things that happens is grass is very important for the soil. What grass does is grass starts to break up rock into soil particles. Okay, and that so and the and the weeds, the roots of the rock, all right, what of the of the grass. They break down the soil, weathering, chemical weathering and, f and physical um, weathering. And what you find then is you actually start to break rock down into soil, right? So if you're going to have a lot more soil, then you're going to have a soil type that's much more fertile, that is much more beneficial to all of the, the plant types that are growing there. If we have a look, all right, here, when we, we think of this, all right, again, we're thinking we're the most prolific grass is called r uh, the red grass, the roy grass, right, very hardy, okay, and here, these animals, the blessed book, the, the antelopes, they are more common in these areas. A um, long time ago, you'll see that most of these areas, all right, were teeming with animals, but what has happened now, late, uh, you can obviously think, if you look at the area, if we go back to the map, what do you notice? The area is very, very commercialized, urban areas. So urban areas are starting to take over, all right, from the natural vegetation. So the only thing you're probably likely to see roaming around is going to be a cow, all right, or the odd wild animal, the rabbits, etc. Okay, um, when we get to the grasslands, you will actually se see that um, the history has told us that this area over here has been farmed for millions of years, all right? And this farming, they for livestock, so grass. They want to feed it. If they had a tree, they probably used to chop it down, all right? Because that chopping down of the tree for fire, for, for, um, for wood, for fire, for warmth, rather than for, all right, for recreation or anything like that. Okay. All right, I think, I think, I think we need to Before we break. step into the next thing, we yes, should take a little ad I think ad that's break. a good idea. All right, so on that note, mindsetters, I hope you don't disappear anywhere. Fine, go do what you have to do. Go to the bathroom, go get a snack, whatever. But make sure you come back right after this quick ad break. See you soon.